Well, good morning. Pastor Chris Myros here, Glory Baptist Church. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your weekend to come and worship here at Glory Baptist with us. Now, of course, we're not able to gather in person, but digitally we can lift our hearts and minds together and make much of Jesus, and so that's what we're going to do. A couple of uh, quick announcements for you, and then we will move on into the rest of our worship time today. If you didn't, you can download off the church's website. We have a bulletin that our office admin, Trish, continues to produce each week for everyone who would like that. And if you just go to aitkinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N, church.com. If you're on a computer at the top, there'll be different bars under the media heading will be worship bulletins. If you're on a phone or a tablet, oftentimes it turns those into uh, three little lines. And if you click on that, it opens up a, a little drop-down box. Then you can select media and choose the, the worship bulletin section there. Find the one for this week, and then you can look at that, download it, and, and use it. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of things that are useful. It has different things you can be in prayer for for this week. It also has notes for sermon notes. And then it has other informational items um, that you may want to know more about. So again, that's akinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N, church.com. Uh, one of the things we, we are doing is we have rolled out online giving. We started this just as the COVID-19 crisis started. And if you have not signed up, um, we would love to have you join us uh, with online giving. It's a very easy, simple, painless process. It's a safe and secure system. I used this in my previous church, the same company, and um, it is a, a very good company with a very good system, and they have very easy processes to get you signed up. If you are uncertain about how to do it still, there's a guide on the website for that under the Give category. And if you're still uncertain after all of that, we have a couple of people in our church who would be happy to help you get all that sorted and get you signed up. Uh, contact us, and we will have either Ruth Eggstead or David Baker um, make sure that you get all of that set up so that it operates and functions. You can give it an ongoing basis. You can give one-time gifts. You have all kinds of different options and different ways to give. There's no cost to you. The church absorbs the cost of that operation of that system. So if you give $100, the church receives $100. And, and we, we are so thankful for so many people who have faithfully been giving and continue to allow us to do the things that we are doing here at Glory Baptist Church. So thank you for your partnership. Uh, we do appreciate it. And if you need any help with that, just let us know. Um, lots of things in the bulletin, of course. Every week there's always things for you there. Um, we're celebrating a, a, a new baby boy born to Lori and Logan Solon. Um, I think that's how you say it. It's uh, Steve and Julie Hughes's um, uh, grandson, and his name is Finn and uh, we're, we're excited for them. Uh, we have a couple other young ones on the way in our broader church community, uh, praying for the Heard family and their little boy on the way, and praying for the Daniels family with a grandson on the way there. Um, our family of the week, as we're praying for people, is Judy Pearson. Our verse of the week is James 1, 2 through 4. Um, lots of things to keep in prayer. Continue to pray for the Flowers family, having lost Sunny Flowers uh, two weeks ago now and um, continue to lift them up, continue to pray for all the people who are recovering from be it shoulder surgeries or cancers or heart repairs and valve replacements and all the things that we've had going on in our church. We're certainly praying for the COVID-19 and the impact that's having on the world, praying for all sorts of people at all sorts of levels that are serving us fantastically. The healthcare systems, ENTs, fire, police, People working at nursing homes, janitors, office admin staff who, who are receiving people in at places, linesmen who fix power lines, and, and police officers, and EMTs, and firemen, and people who serve at gas stations, and grocery stores, and there's all kinds of people involved that we may often take for granted, but we certainly want to now be in prayer for, uh, giving thanks and praise, and praying for their protection as they are serving on our behalf to allow us the freedom to stay at home and to stay healthy, happy, and safe. Um, of course, pray for our government officials. Um, this is a tough time, and I do not envy our government leaders because they have some difficult choices ahead and uh, potentially no good solutions because always somebody's gonna be unhappy. And so that's what leadership is. 
but still it's a very difficult thing when potentially lives hang in the balance. And so uh, just pray that our leaders would have wisdom. And, and of course, we always need to be praying for our leaders. That's something that the Bible is, is very clear about, that we should pray for them. As I said in the bulletin, there are sermon notes in there. If you would like sermon notes, that's where you will find them. And you can download those and use those at your own leisure. We will be in John 21 today. So if you don't have a Bible handy, run and grab it now so that it's ready when we get to the sermon here in a few minutes. I would like to pray. If you would join me in prayer, then we will move into reading God's word as we set up the sermon today. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. First and foremost, God, we thank you for your son Jesus and his great love of us. Uh, we just celebrated Easter and truly we are humbled and amazed by your provision of your greatest gift of Jesus to us and that we did not deserve it, we could not earn it, but yet you gave it despite our failings and failures and flaws and problems that we cause. You loved us anyhow, so we are humbled and amazed by that. And God, on this day, we have so much that we have to, to thank you for. We thank you for all the things that we listed before and so much more. We, we thank you for those who, who have come before us to allow us to be in this place with the freedom to worship on the internet openly and publicly without fear of retribution. That is a, a wonderful thing. We thank you for the technology to do this, Lord, uh, the chance that while we are separate, we can still be together, and that is a blessing. God, I thank you for each and every person who's been part of this church, and we miss them enormously. We look forward to seeing them again. We pray that they are well. Lord, if we can love and serve and bless anyone, please show us the way. And God, we thank you for all that you have done on our behalf. Continue to watch over us, bless us, and keep us. Provide for us that we might know, love, and serve you every day of our lives. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, again, welcome to Glory Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chris Myros, and I am so glad that you are here with us today. Now, if you would, turn with me to the book of John. We're going to close out our series on John. This is the very last of the sermon series from the book of John. We've been in this for quite some time. And I would like to read to you uh, John 21 is where we're going to be at. And so if you have a Bible, grab that out. If you don't have a Bible, uh, version, Y-O-U, version. Um, you can download an app there. It works on your computer. It works on your tablet. It's a, a great system. It's what I use for my daily devotions. Uh, I read out of the Bible on it every day, and I do devotions out of it every day. It's incredibly handy because my phone goes with me everywhere, so um, I do recommend that system to you. I love a, a paper Bible because I love taking notes and writing and highlighting and scribbling all over it, but there's also something to be said for just the convenience and simplicity of, of having it right there on my phone. So um, I, I recommend that to everyone. Anyhow, if you've got a Bible, grab it up. I'm going to read to you here. Uh, John 21, 1 through 24. And there Jesus appears to seven disciples, it says. After this, Jesus, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. And so he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord! When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, 
Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? So Simon Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said it to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Then it says, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to them, follow me. Peter turned and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers and the disciples was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the reading of God's Word. Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's a, a searching question, isn't it, to have Jesus ask you specifically, pointedly, do you love me? Peter, you see, had left Jerusalem. He's gone, what, uh, 100 miles or so north to Galilee, where he's from. He's gone back to his former way of life. He's gone back to fishing. And Peter and the rest of the disciples, they've been following Jesus now for the better part of the last three years. And Peter was a, was a married man and presumably had a family. And now that Jesus had died and he's revealed himself to the disciples in the upper room and disappeared again, Peter has gone back home, gone back to his former way of life. And in this closing chapter of John's Gospel, in a sense, um, you might expect John to have actually finished the Gospel at the end of chapter 20. If you don't know the end of chapter 20, uh, at the close of chapter 20, John gives the very reason why he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote in order that the signs and miracles that he writes about Jesus there, that, that they would convince us that those who read it, that this gospel, that it would convince us of the truthfulness of Jesus, that they might put their faith in him and that they might, through that, inherit eternal life. But there's one more thing, because John, as, as he writes the gospel, he doesn't only want to just tell us about the way to salvation, he also wants us to understand and learn about discipleship. He wants to write to us and he wants to tell us what exactly does it look like to follow Jesus Christ? Um, and what better person to tell that story than Peter? So he picks out Peter, the Apostle Peter. Wasn't the Apostle at the time, but he picks out Peter Peter, who had just recently so catastrophically denied Jesus publicly three different times on the night of his betrayal. 
Now John doesn't actually tell us this, but this isn't the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus that Peter has seen. Luke records for us in, in, in a very brief section that Jesus had in fact appeared previously to Simon Peter. And the details of that appearance are, aren't given. We, we don't know the details, but I can imagine that initial encounter, and it seems like it must have been quite brief, but that initial encounter Peter has with the resurrected Jesus it, it had to be a painful one for him, right? Painful to, to look Jesus in the face, even if just for a moment, because as he's seeing Jesus, he's seeing him through the lens of knowing that he had denied this man three times. And now here in chapter 21, some time has passed. Simon Peter has gone back to his fishing business. We're introduced at the very beginning of the chapter to the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, same place, different name. And we're told that there's others there. Thomas called Didymus. Uh, he's there. Nathaniel of, of Cana in Galilee is there. The sons of Zebedee are also there, which of course then one of the sons of Zebedee is John, the author of the Gospel of John. And, and so Simon Peter says in verse 3, I'm going fishing. Now you understand when Peter says that, I'm going fishing. It's not like that sort of thing that we might do, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, we're heading up to the cabin, uh, we're, we're going to go fishing, we're going to have some fun, uh, we're going to go fishing with the guys, right, where it's, you know, where we live in a part of Minnesota where everybody seems to fish, and, and as if there's not enough fishing where we live, people take trips from fishing here to fish elsewhere. So we're going to go to the Lake of the Woods, and it's the boys' getaway weekend, right, we're going to go fishing up there, or, you know, it's, guys do that, or, or ice fishing, right, you've got these guys who buy these ice castles and buy these big trucks to tow them out there to sit there and and catch fish through the ice here in the winters in Minnesota. And, and so for some, it's just kind of like the guy thing to do. It's, you know, a manly thing. Some people like to fish because, you know, they want their, spend some quality time with their kids. They, they bring their kids out fishing. And I, and I want my son to learn how to fish because I love to fish. I want him to learn how to fish. So we're going to go out and we're going to spend some time fishing. And so, so we do that. Other people, fishing is just simply a getaway. I, I want to get away from everybody. I, I don't want to see anybody. I'm going to go sit in a boat where nobody else is at, and I'm going to fish. And, and for those people, catching the fish sometimes is really secondary to just the peaceful being alone uh, on your own kind of thing. But that's not, that's not what Peter's talking about here. This was how Peter earned his living. This was Peter's job. This is, this is what he did. This was something that Peter knew an awful lot about, right? Grew up in a family of fishermen, has been a fisherman for all of his life. If you'd asked him, Peter, what do you do for work? Well, I'm a fisherman. I catch fish. I know stuff about fishing, right? That, that's who Peter was. And do you understand the significance then of, of what Peter is saying here? He's failed, right? He's failed Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I suspect everybody who's watching today, you've probably experienced failure at some point. Maybe yours is a big failure, maybe not. I don't know. I, I've failed. I've had some big failures in my life. I've had some things that just, they haunt you sometimes, right? Most of us know what it means to fail. We've all failed at some task or another. But to fail at discipleship, to let Jesus down, right? To promise Jesus something and then to catastrophically and incredibly publicly let him down? The sense of failure, it can be crippling, can't it? There are some people who, if they had done what Peter had done, if they had failed in that way and in that public way, right? There's people who would be in therapy for the rest of their lives because of that. There's some people who, who would be like, I don't think I can get out of bed this morning because of it. People who would struggle about going about their day because of the weight of this failure. People who, who would just feel like they couldn't face life with this crippling pressure of, of, of this failure upon them. Failure can almost be debilitating if we're not careful. Now imagine having let the Savior down. How? How? 
Could Peter, how? How could Simon Peter ever become an apostle? How could he ever be useful in the kingdom of God ever again? I mean, look what he's done. And so, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Because at least I know something about fishing. It's a safe place for him, you see. Fishing for Peter, that was a comfort zone. It was his comfort zone. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not a real big place. It's roughly, give or take, about half of the size of the Malacs. So not a, a real large body of water. And if you grew up fishing there, if you made your living fishing there, you knew where the fish were, right? If, if you're a guide on Mille Lacs, and you fish Mille Lacs every day, you get to know Mille Lacs very well. You know when the weather's like this, this is where you fish. This time of year, this is where you fish. This time of day, there's a sandbar over here. There's, there's a clump of trees under the water over here, and they like to hide in there in the shade in the afternoon on the hot summer days. You know how to fish if you've if you fished that area, right? And, and that's Peter. Peter has fished this. He, he knew all about the weather patterns. He knew all the... He had his honey holes where he knew he could go, and he knew every single time there was going to be some fish in there, and, and, and he was going to be able to provide for his family that way. He, he knew fishing on the Sea of Galilee, right? And you see what's happened here in the story. They've been fishing all night. Skunked. They haven't caught a thing. Now they, they fish with nets. They don't fish with poles. And they've been throwing their nets all night, dragging these heavy wet nets back in. Did you guys see a fish in there? No, no fish. And early in the morning, right at dawn, right? These guys have been out on the boat all night long. There's like this there's somebody over there. There's this shadowy figure over on shore. You know, like, like a hundred yards out, maybe. He's over there, by the beach. And you hear a voice, right? And it's a man's voice, and the, and the guy goes, Friends, you guys caught anything? How's the, how's the fishing today? Now you know, right? If Simon Peter had actually caught some fish, I should be like, oh yeah, do great. But they had spent a whole night in a the boat. They had put the nets in and out. And in and out. Tried this spot. Tried that spot. This spot always has fish. No fish. They, they moved all over, right? They tried everything. There's always fish. Where's the fish? Why aren't we catching any fish? And now, after a whole night of that, this guy is over here and he's, he's going, hey, how's the fishing? Right? And you can imagine the frustration. I mean, Peter's got the weight of this failure. Now he's got this, this frustration. And you, you can imagine Peter might just be a little bit irritated at this point. I mean, I can imagine the mood that Simon Peter might be in. He'd gone back to fishing because of his failure at discipleship. And, 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 and that had to be nagging at the back of his mind. And, and now there's this guy who's asking how the fishing is, and we haven't caught a single fish. And then this dude, he's got the nerve, right? Can you imagine this? Not only did he ask how the fishing is, but then he goes on to say, Hey, drop down your nets on the other side of the boat. Like, what? I have made my living in these waters. I have spent more hours in this boat than you can imagine. I know this lake like the back of my hands. And you? Over there? You're going to tell me where to catch fish? Are you serious? I mean, who is this guy, right? They've been there all night trying to catch fish. Hadn't had a, a single fish. Now this voice in the shoreline saying, drop down your nets on the other side of the boat. I don't know about you, but I, I can imagine how I would feel in this situation. And Simon Peter, I can just imagine his face when he's like, all right, fine, whatever. So he... Tosses the nets on the other side of the boat. I mean, all right, let's get this guy to shut up and leave us alone, right? Tired of this. It's time to go in. Calling it a day, but fine. Throw the stupid net in one more time on the other side of the boat. So they do it. And then, 
I can imagine him kind of rumbling and grumbling as he's doing it. Oh, stupid. Right? They throw it in and they cinch that net closed. And they start to tug on it because you've got to pull those nets back in. All of a sudden it's, it's pulling a little harder than it had all night. And pretty soon you can feel there's a weight. There's some mass in there. And then maybe you can start to feel the fish. They're trying to swim. I mean, they're, they're captured and the net's closing around them and they're trying to get away. And you can feel them pulling in every direction against this net. And you're going, what is going on here? And, and, and you start pulling this in and you're, you're, you're seeing, we're, 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 we've caught the mother load. I mean, what's going on here, right? And as this is going on, as this is happening, uh, John tells us, the author of the Gospel, John, he, he, he recognizes this guy who's been yelling at them, is Jesus. Right? Hey guys, that's Jesus. That's Jesus who's been yelling at us. And, and it's in that moment that Peter, of course, throws his, throws his outer garment back on you. He'd stripped it off. They were fishing. It could have been hot. I don't know what was going on. But throws his jacket back on, or his outer garment, as they called it, and throws that back on and heads off towards Christ. Right? Gets in the water and swims and wades and whatever he's got to do and heads, heads towards Jesus, half wading, half swimming, whatever he's got to do. I'm sure it would have been awkward. He's got his, his robe, his clothes on, and, and, and he's, but he's going to make his way towards Jesus. And what is the lesson in this story? I think it's a wonderful lesson. I think it's a humbling lesson. And in many ways, probably a painful lesson, but a lesson that Peter needed, and I think a lot of us need. You see, Jesus would not allow Simon Peter to catch one solitary fish, because that was not what Jesus wanted him to do. It might sound a little backwards, but that's almost a mercy, isn't it? Because in a sense, Simon Peter was running. He was running away. In a sense, Simon Peter's trying to go back to his former life. And it's almost as though Jesus is saying to him here, No, Peter. You want to catch fish. And you will catch fish. But only on my behest, at my command. And when I tell you to, you will catch more fish than you ever dreamed of but only at my direction. The story tells us in John. It was a 153 fish. But did you notice in the story, John makes it very, very clear. And if you read the text carefully, you'll see. Jesus says to them, bring the fish. They're going to have breakfast, right? It's a wonderful scene. Yeah, Jesus and the guys reunited. We're having breakfast. We're on the beach. Everything's awesome. Everything's great, right? But it's a little point John is making here that I think Jesus is making here. And John points out to us that Jesus already has some fish cooking. Even though he tells Simon Peter, bring your fish, right? He already has the fish that they're going to eat for breakfast. Now, it's just a little detail, just a small detail, but it's almost like an extra, extra poke from Jesus. He's poking Peter a little bit. He's, I, won't, I don't want to say rubbing it in because that's not really the best. It's very negative in connotation, but, but he's making sure Peter knows, making sure that Peter understands that even the fish that you're going to eat for breakfast, I've provided it, Peter. Jesus has caught it. Jesus has made it. What they're doing has nothing to do with Peter's works. And this is all to do with the supply and providence and governance and control of Jesus. How, how Jesus puts a, a, a boundary and a hedge around our lives. And it's as though he's saying to Peter, You've been trying to run away, but I'm not going to let you run because I've got something so much greater in store for you. 
See, Jesus had a plan for Peter. Now, I don't know about you, but that's, that's wonderfully encouraging for me. Maybe you failed. Maybe you've even let the Savior down in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you've been running from God. Well, Jesus isn't going to let you run away. Because running away is not the answer. Running back to your former life, that's not the answer. Going off by yourself and having a pity party, party that's, that, that's, that's not the answer. I at least find that it's a very encouraging truth. And that at every step of the way, Jesus was watching over and providing for Peter. But in order to do that, notice what Jesus has to do. He's got to humble our, our, our friend Peter a little bit. And Peter, of course, is such a great case study out of the Bible, and he's so relatable. I, I enjoy Peter enormously. And it's, it's as though even, you remember that first little meeting that I mentioned, that Luke mentions? Jesus meets Peter briefly. I can imagine how that feels to Peter. Just, ooh. And now, here's Jesus again. Jesus isn't going to go anywhere because we're having breakfast and I'm going to sit down and we're going to be close and it's going to be an intimate setting and oof, I'm going to have to deal with this. It's all kind of coming together for Peter. And it's all about how Jesus is at this point almost, he's pricking the balloon of Peter's ego. He's reminding Peter of just how little Peter could do without Jesus. Everything here, Peter. All the fish you caught? Told you how to catch them. Told you where. The fish you're going to eat? My fish. The campfire that's cooking it? My logs? My fire. Peter couldn't do it on his own. Peter needed the help and the power of Jesus Christ. As I thought about it, Tweek, I sounds kind of strange, but I had socks running through my head. I do not like 100% cotton socks because they shrink. Every single one of them. I have a size 13 foot. So when my socks shrink, and I was already at the maximum size of whatever sock, that makes those socks a little uncomfortable for me. They don't look right, they don't fit right, they're not comfortable, and that's frustrating. So when I buy socks, I try to avoid 100% cotton socks and try to get some sort of blend, ideally, right? Some of us Christians kind of think of ourselves as a, as a shrink-resistant material, right? Like, I've got this. And we've got this big ego. And it doesn't need to be shrunk. I can handle this. I'm an expert at this. I know what I'm doing here. I, I've done this before. I'm a pro. I don't need help with this. I don't need you for this. I've got this. Probably how Peter felt going into the boat that day before he got skunked that night. I got this. I know how to fish. But Jesus comes in and he's got to shrink us sometimes. Sometimes that is a good thing. And he says, I'm going to shrink you. I'm going to humble you. And he does this to Peter. And he'll do this to you and me too. I'm going to shrink you. I'm going to humble you. But I'm going to, I'm going to teach you, as we do that, that you actually needed this. So you can rely upon me. So that you can trust me. So that you can want more of me and less of you. And it's at this point in the story, if you're following along, that, that Jesus asks Simon Peter this question three times. Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me? Well, the first time, Simon Peter's like, yeah, I love you, Lord. Simon, son of John, do you love me? I just said yes, but yeah, yeah, Jesus, I love you. Simon, son of John, do you love me? I can imagine, and that third time, kind of like the alarm bell going off in Peter's mind, right? He just asked me a third time. I denied him three times. The anguish, probably the shame, the frustration, the fear, the worry, all that. Mixed emotions going on in Peter. I, I can just imagine what that was like. And Jesus isn't asking this by accident, by the way. This is on purpose. He knows what he's doing. And Peter, of course, is grieved. I can imagine maybe a little irritated, frustrated, confused. And here's Jesus knocking at his heart's door. Remember, Peter? Three times. Not once, not twice. Three times, you denied me, publicly. Peter, do you love me? Now in the story, we get to see something of Peter's great heart. And like I was saying, I, I love Peter. Peter is so relatable. Peter is, is the old ready, fire, aim kind of guy, right? He's the open mouth, insert foot. He, 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 he leaps before he looks. He, he speaks before he thinks. And that's what makes Peter so, so relatable to me. I, I love that about Peter because I share some of those very human flaws at times, right? And so, so I love Peter. Peter is one of the best characters. I, I love him in, in the Bible. I can relate to him so well compared to some others who are, you know, who are like these high, holy, great spiritual men. And, oh, I struggle to relate with those guys. But Peter... Peter, on the other hand, he's constantly doing things. He lops a guy's ear off. He, he, he's constantly just doing stuff. Jumps out of the boat one day when Jesus is walking onto the water, right? Doesn't give any thought to it. Peter is an infinitely relatable guy, and I love that about him. And in this, we get a little bit of, we get to hear a little bit of Peter's hearts here, his heart. And we get to see it, and we get to see who Peter is, warts and all, in this story. And... You sense something of his heart when he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And isn't that so often how it is with us? Yes, Jesus, I love you, but yeah, I let you down today. I failed you. Yes, Jesus, I love you, but boy, whew, I blew it there. Yes, Jesus, I love you, but, oh, man, I was a terrible husband today. I was not a good father. I did not model the love of Christ in any way in that situation. Yes, Jesus, I love you, but I fail you. And here's Peter in this tension. There's this, the, the flesh lusting against the spirit, the spirit fighting against the flesh in him, right? You got, you got this great battle going on in him. He wants to do good, but yet he's done evil. He wants to worship and follow Jesus, but yet he's failed, and he's failed spectacularly. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. It's, it's great to say that you love someone, right? My son. I have a, a wonderful, incredibly loving 10-year-old son. And still at the age of 10, he's willing to say, Hey, Dad, I love you. I love that about my son, and I hope that never changes. And I love saying back to my son, I love you too, buddy. I really do. Brings me joy every time I get to say that. Because I know... Someday that may stop. He may not want to say it like that. But I'm so glad that he does. And it's all well and good to say, I love you. But we need to back that up then, don't we? There needs to be some, some evidence. 
How can we show that? Well, Peter's got to be wondering, how do I recover from this? I have failed spectacularly, enormously. I've denied Jesus three times. I, I've told him I love him. But what can I do? Notice what Jesus says. Peter, do you love me? Tend to my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Because you see, Jesus was calling Simon Peter to be an apostle, to, to be a pastor, to, to, to do something great, right? Eventually, the, the church is founded on Peter. And we know the story of Peter, that his following of Jesus will eventually lead to his losing his life because of his following of Jesus. Now Christ is telling him, the way to show your love is to feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. And then in verse 18 he says, truly, truly, I say to you, right? When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will dress you and bring you where you do not wish to go. And John then explains that, that Jesus said this signified by what death Peter would die and how it would glorify God. And tradition has it, the church history has it, that, that Simon Peter is crucified as Jesus was crucified with one important difference. If you don't know the story, when they go to crucify Peter, he does not feel as though he is worthy to they be crucified as Jesus was crucified. And so he asks them to crucify him upside down, head towards the ground. And they do this at Peter's request outside the city of Rome. And so Peter, of course, and this is such a, a Peter-like thing in the story here, seeing the Apostle John in this moment as, as Jesus is telling him, hey Peter, you want to give evidence of that you love me, feed my sheep. What's Peter do? What about John? Right? Lord, well, what about him? And I, and I love Jesus' response. It's a, it's a great parental response. If you've worked with kids more than one at a time, you know, you know this. You've undoubtedly had to use this type of response. And I can just see Jesus kind of looking at Peter almost maybe in disbelief, and just kind of shaking his head in a moment, just going, Peter, never mind. I'll deal with him later. I'm talking to you now, pal. As far as you are concerned, Peter, there's only one requirement. What is that? Well, verse 22. Follow me. Peter, Follow me. Follow me wherever it takes you, wherever I send you, wherever your life goes. Follow me. First Peter even says that, that God had so ordered the church from the very beginning that, that death is, is the way to life and that the cross is the way to victory, right? It says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross to gain your life. You will lose it. And only if you are prepared to lose your life will you actually gain it. Those are words Peter shares with us later. And this is such a, a wonderful chapter in the book of John. And it, and it deserves, honestly, more time than probably just one sermon can give it. But that's all I'm going to give it. Because this is the conclusion of our study in the book of John. But you see what John is doing here at the very close of the, this Gospel of John. He's told us all about Jesus. He's told us all about the glory of Jesus. He's told us about who Jesus is and what he's done on behalf of sinners. And now, in the very, very last chapter, he's saying to Peter, but he's saying to us, now follow me. Now follow Jesus. 
follow Jesus wherever that might lead. My question for you today is, are you prepared to do exactly that? Are you willing to do what it takes to follow Jesus? Whatever that might lead. That might mean Jesus calling you to go serve in a mud hut somewhere on the other side of the world as a missionary. Are you ready to heed that call? Are you willing to follow me? Now, for most of us, he won't call us to some mud hut on the other side of the world. But for all of us, he's calling us to follow him somewhere. Each and every one of us has an opportunity to make much of Jesus as we follow him. And the question is, are you prepared for that? Are you willing to follow him? Wherever that might go, whatever that cost might be. If he asks you to deny yourself and to take up the cross and to walk down a road of trial and difficulty, will you follow him? If he asks you to, to move somewhere you don't want to go, or to take a job you didn't want to have, or, or, or to make friends with somebody you really didn't like, or to forgive somebody you did not want to forgive, are you prepared to follow him? To love sacrificially? To give generously? to do whatever it takes to follow him. Are you willing, when Jesus says to follow me, to follow him? That's what discipleship means. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is coming to the end of ourselves and giving ourselves entirely to the control and direction of Jesus. And just as Jesus had a plan for Peter, he's got a plan for you, and he has a plan for me. Are you willing, and are you ready to follow him? If there's any barriers, get them out of the way. Do what it takes, today even, to begin to follow him. And as you do that, the blessings will be amazing. Maybe not what you expected, maybe not what you had wished or hoped for, but I promise you that God will bless you as you follow him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this story and every story that we have in your word. Your word is true and it's trustworthy and it's good in all forms for our edification for our education, for our inspiration, and just for our opportunity to learn about you. So God, we are thankful for your word, the Bible. We are thankful for your son, Jesus, as we are one week removed from Easter. The love that he poured out on the cross on our behalf, humbling, it's amazing. We are so thankful, Jesus, that you came, you lived, you died, you rose again. And for those who believe in him, we can inherit eternal life. And God, we just thank you so much that as we hear these stories of, of men like Peter, that we are reminded that even when we try to run from you, that we can't ever get away from you. That you pursue us, that you love us, that you keep after us, that you have a, a plan for us, that you have something great in store for us. If only we would turn to you and follow you. So God, in this day, if somebody who's listening to my voice has been running, I pray that right now, Lord, they would stop. Stop running and turn to you. God, I don't know what the issues are. I don't know what the problems are. You know what they are. But Lord, there's so many people who've been running from you for so long and Running just wears us out. Running is so tiring, Lord. 
I pray right now in this very moment that those who've been running from you would realize they can't get away, they can't run away, they can't run to some place you are already not there. And Lord, may they turn and surrender to you. And God, for the rest of us, all of us, we have failed. We know failure. We want to be ambassadors for Christ, and yet we mess that up so frequently. God, we thank you that you keep giving us chances. And we thank you, God, that you keep working with us. And we thank you, God, that you don't give up on us. And we thank you, God, that every single day is another chance to follow you. So, Lord, on this day, may each and every one of us recommit ourselves to following you. Lord, may we do whatever it takes. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for this time. Continue to be with us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves you. If you've never heard that before, I want you to hear that today. He loves you. He's, he's not against you. He's for you. He's not out to get you. He wants to love you and be in relationship with you. That is the good news of the gospel. Even when we run, God pursues us. And he's always waiting there to take us back home. Now, if Jesus gave that love to the world through the church, our job as the church is to share that with the world. And so we here at Glory Baptist Church would love to serve you, bless you, if we could pray for you. If there's something we could do, please let us know. You can give us a call, send us an email. Shoot me a, a Facebook message, send us a text. If we can love you, serve you, bless you, pray for you, we will do our best to do so. And not only that, if there's something you need to equip yourself to grow spiritually, right now, at this time, during the social distancing, is a fantastic opportunity for so many people to have a chance to grow spiritually. It's taken away a lot of the distractions of the world. It's taken away a lot of sports. It's taken away a lot of watching of, of things on television. It's taken away a lot of gatherings and a lot of meetings. And so if you want, this is a fantastic time for you to begin growing spiritually. Spend some extra time in prayer. Spend some extra time reading God's Word and the Bible. Spend some time in devotions. Maybe spend some time calling other people and just encouraging them in the name of Jesus Christ. But don't overlook it. This is a great opportunity to grow closer to God. And if we at the church here at Glory Baptist Church can help you in that in some way, please let us know. We would love to do so. Thanks again for spending a little bit of your weekend with us. We are praying for you. We are all in this together. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. Go and serve your King. Amen.